Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. It's been a little while since I've done like a personal story style of video. These actually make me a lot more nervous than my video essays which take like 80 hours of like reading and research and scripting and everything. It's a lot more nerve wracking to talk about my personal life but I wanted to record this video because it kind of documents what I've been experiencing over the past couple of months and I also think it might be useful for other people who suffer from things like social anxiety to know what it's like when you totally give yourself complete exposure therapy and what you could kind of expect to happen to you emotionally from that. I think this video might also offer some practical advice for people who are thinking of doing a work exchange or just working in a hostel in general and what you might expect. So before I get into the reasons why I chose to do this hostel experience, even though it's clearly gonna be a disaster, I think it would be helpful to provide some context for what I mean when I talk about social anxiety and sorts of the ways in which I interact with other people. So like many people, I was a very shy child. I didn't like interacting with people. I was afraid of other people. At family gatherings, I would hide outside or in the garage or the laundry room. I remember at a family gathering, I finally kind of came out of my shell a little bit. And my uncle was like, this is the first time I've heard you talk in 16 years. And I was 16 years old at the time. I was just always really afraid of people unless I knew them already on a very deep level. And when it came to college, I would often go weeks without opening my mouth to anyone. I was living in my car at the time, so I didn't have to socialize. And besides the financial reason and the fact that I was facing intermittent homelessness, I also wanted to live alone because I had just a series of kind of like psycho roommates. Like I'd have a handful of roommates who were fine and who I'd get along with, but there would just be one person who makes the absolute experience awful. And I just couldn't deal with the stress of that anymore. I hated being afraid in the place that I'm living in and having to lock myself in the closet to avoid my roommates because I'm terrified of them because they're banging on my door telling me that they're gonna beat me up and like all the kind of stuff that happens when you end up with people who aren't super sane. And also in college, if someone made eye contact with me on the bus or anything, I'd look away immediately. It always confused me when people would smile at me. In classrooms, if someone came up to me to talk to me, to try to be my friend, I would literally just give one word responses and look away. Like I was not about to make friends. I obviously came across as rude because I didn't talk to anybody. But what it really was was that I was just absolutely terrified. So not only am I just intrinsically afraid of people and shy, I also have had very bad experiences with people which is why whenever I have enough money to sublet somewhere for a month or two by myself, I take it. I don't care if it means being broke because I literally need that for my sanity. Which leads me in to why I chose to do this experiment. And it is multifold reasoning, but the main reason was because I couldn't afford rent anymore. So I needed somewhere to live for free or where I could make money and just afford rent. And so I thought, well, if I stay in this hostel for a couple of months, number one, free rent. Number two, I make money because at the time it was posted as a paid gig. I'll only be working part-time, so I'll be able to work part-time on my YouTube channel, which is what actually brings me joy in my life. And I'll be able to scope out a new city, one that I might wanna to move to permanently, and then find a more permanent place to live. It just seemed like a very practical option for me. And on top of that, in my head, was the added benefit of socializing with people, of fulfilling my social needs, and making new friends when I'm in a new environment where I don't know anybody. It all just seemed very practical to me in my head. So I applied for the position and I got on the Zoom call with the boss and he informed me that he no longer had paid positions. And so I was like, well, I'll do this position. Even if it's unpaid, I'll at least have time to work on my YouTube channel and I won't be paying any rent. So I got a flight for the end of the month and when it came, I went and there I arrived in the East Coast. Part one, first impressions. So it's important to remember that my mentality going into this was to work on my YouTube channel as much as possible. So I wanted to spend the majority of my free time working on that. I kind of came into it with a sort of hustling mentality because I was there for a reason. But when I arrived at the hostel, it was 2 p.m. I was led to my room, the whole floor smelled like weed. There was, you know, three people in there because I share a room with three people. And two of those people were still asleep, even though it was 2 p.m. But whatever, you know what? People are eccentric. That's fine. And so the manager of the hostel goes and takes me around town and she warns me about a roommate, which I will call Marcus, and how he's extremely loud and takes up a lot of space and you kind of just have to work your schedule around him and that he had been there for 11 months, so he obviously wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. He was essentially a permanent resident. The first thing I did was go and try to find toothpaste and all the kind of toiletries I might need 
So I walked to Walgreens, and just to give you an idea of this neighborhood, you literally have to ask the employees to unlock the toothpaste if you want to buy it. And all the shelves are half empty, and the place is pretty dirty and run down. And the hostel especially was very dirty, like ceiling to floor. But whatever, doesn't really matter. I kind of <laughs> come from a place that's a little bit dirty. No offense if you're from my hometown. So I didn't really care too much. I just wanted to explore the city, which is what I did for the first two days, because I didn't have to work until day three. And so my overall feeling the first few days was that I absolutely loved the city that I was in, the living environment was not good. Part two, the actual job. And so on the third day, I actually started the job, which was of course very easy. The first half of the day is just manual labor, so cleaning everything, stripping the beds, making the beds, doing all the laundry, folding, all of that kind of stuff, just regular kind of hostile work. And then the second half of the day was more of the customer service oriented stuff because that's when people start checking in and you have to help show them the rooms and everything, make sure their credit card information is correct and all of that. I of course preferred the manual labor because I don't like interacting with people. And so the way the work schedule worked was that I would work three days out of the week for nine hours each day and then the other days I would have off. And I also rarely ever saw the boss. He lived on a different property and he'd only come over if there was like an urgent dispute with a customer or something of that nature if something needed to be repaired. But there was a manager who I got along with and she was always my favorite person to work with who we could kind of go to if we had any issues. The other thing about the hostel is since it is the lowest priced place to stay in the city, you do get a lot of like criminals and creepy people. People try to break in, people steal mail. It, it just kind of comes with the territory. But you do meet a lot of international people, which is cool. And when it came to the days that were very not busy, like very few guests coming in, the second half of the day, if I was working alone, I could oftentimes work on YouTube. And so when it comes to the living situation, by this day, my back and body were starting to hurt because the mattresses were really flimsy and the bunk beds were really poorly constructed. And then every day from like 2 a.m. to about 6 a.m., that guy Marcus is coming in and out, shining his flashlight, wrestling through all of his belongings, which are just in bags on the floor making a lot of noise. He went to bed at like 5 a.m. every day and he was always, you know, going through his 20 plus phones and all of their text messages and so on. We obviously all thought he was a drug dealer, but later he did talk to me about what crimes he actually does and he's not a drug dealer. He does other things, which I'll explain later. But I basically haven't had a full night's sleep. My body is aching. I'm going through a lot of anxiety because I haven't had a moment to myself. Also that guy Marcus will not leave me alone throughout the first two weeks. He would wake me up in my sleep to talk to me. If I had headphones in, he'd make me take them out and talk to me. I was really excited for the person on the bottom bunk to leave so that way I could at least have the blankets down so the light would be out when he's shining his flashlight everywhere. But what bothered me the most besides the sleep deprivation was simply him not leaving me alone, like literally ever. Part three, social exhaustion. But at the end of the first week, my social battery had been way over full and we were gonna have a Labor Day party, which was gonna begin right when my shift ended at 6 p.m. So I figured, you know what, I'll just take a nap between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m., try to cool down. Hopefully I'll have the dorm room to myself. And then that will make it easier for me to socialize with these people because I know it's gonna be a, a really intense and difficult experience for me. And then I figure, okay, how am I gonna get through this social situation? I'll go with my go-to, which is get blackout drunk. That tends to be what I do. So healthy. So at the little cookout, I'm drinking heavily. I'm keeping my composure. I'm just trying to get through the situation, try to act normal. Thankfully, when I'm drinking a lot, I can sometimes act very much sober. So I was just trying to act sober, trying to quell my anxiety with the alcohol, and just trying to get through so that way I could go to sleep and just feel like I accomplished something, which was socialization. And so I was fine through the party, it was going well, and then everyone went to bed except for me and Marcus. And then at some point when we're drinking, he points out self-harm scars that I have on my legs, and then I start trauma dumping, and then I totally blacked out. So all I remember is that we talked about mental health issues and stuff which I hate doing with strangers. And I hate it when strangers do that to me, like this trauma dumping stuff, but I feel like we're all kind of guilty of it. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of us. I just hate forcing intimacy between people because I have to really get to know someone and trust them before I start opening up about issues that I have, obviously. And when other people trauma dump to me when they first meet me or very shortly after meeting me, I feel like they're going to end up taking advantage of me, that they're trying to forge an intimacy so that way they could take advantage of me because that's happened multiple times. But at this time, he also apparently admitted to a bunch of his crimes, but we were both, both blacked out. The next day I was vomiting profusely, which I never do from drinking, which just shows how much I was drinking. And we were both kind of like, I can't believe what we talked about last night and kind of rehashed what we remember. I didn't remember about the crimes, although later he admitted at least one of the things he does is credit card fraud and identity theft. 
This guy is the absolute worst. It gets worse as the story goes on, of course. But personally, I can't stand people who steal and are criminals when they're perfectly capable of just getting a job. Like, wh like why are you stealing from other people? Why not just work? Like, it's just really wrong to me. But after that first week, I was like, okay, I'm not gonna drink for the rest of my time here. I also am just gonna try to avoid this Marcus guy because after this, he would not leave me alone. Like I literally had to start waking up when he went to bed, so 5 a.m. so I could have time to myself. And when he woke up, I would get on the subway and get out of there and just spend all day away from him. And then the subway, ri subway ride back, I was just full of dread and anxiety. I did not want to deal with this guy. I had finally gotten the bottom bunk, so I had the blankets, which helped a little bit with sleep. I wasn't up the entire night. My sleep was just interrupted for like three or four hours each night because he still made a lot of noise. But also when I was in my bottom bunk, he would still come in and talk to me and distract me even when I have the blankets down. And the problem with me is that I'm not assertive or communicative enough because I'm afraid if I bring up an issue with someone, like if I tell him, please don't talk to me when I'm in bed, that it's gonna result in like a violent outlash or just getting berated or just like something crazy is gonna happen because I just think so catastrophically. And I'm the exact kind of person who represses my feelings until I explode, as you'll see throughout the story. I actually did try to explain him at one point that I'm an introvert and I tried to explain what that means, but he just kind of took that as an invitation to bother me even more. He's like, oh no, I will, I can't do the Creole accent, but he's like, I will like make sure that you're socializing all the time. I'll break you out of this. You won't be an introvert. I'm like, bro. But basically my social battery is full. Marcus wouldn't leave me alone. And then one day I came home and there were people everywhere, hostile guests everywhere. The bathroom was full, kitchen full, my room full. And I just had really bad anxiety. And so I went on the back porch and started vomiting. And while I was vomiting, Marcus came out and I said, leave me alone. And he wouldn't, he just stayed there while I was vomiting into the bag. Like what is wrong with this person? But thankfully I had made friends with one of the roommates. I was getting along with my manager. Someone else moved in and we got along fine, though she immediately had really serious issues with Marcus. She could not deal with his behavior and they absolutely hated each other. The other thing about Marcus is he literally takes three hour long showers. I'm not even exaggerating. He like has an intermission too. And the whole time he's blasting his boom box so loud you can hear it from the first floor. And all he does all day is smoke weed and call the bank pretending to be other people. He was also a wannabe rapper and he has like the worst voice I've ever heard. He made me listen to his rap songs. I'm like, dude. And he would sing in the shower every day awful. But every morning with my coffee, I was talking to the roommate who I got along with and it was really nice having that sort of friendship because it had been a while since I've chosen to speak with people and to try and make a friend. And it just serves as a reminder that I'm not as unlovable and unbearable as I think I am. Like I actually am capable of making friends, which is really good data to have about yourself when it's not something that you're aware of. I also started to realize what my social anxiety is. And it's a mixture of two things. It's the fear of disappointing someone and not knowing what it is that they want out of me. And then number two, being a burden on them. So when I think someone's gonna talk to me, which is really scary, what I'm afraid of is not giving them whatever it is that they want. Like they're talking to me for a reason. How do I make sure they're happy? How do I make sure they're getting whatever that they're trying to get? And how do I not disappoint them? Because that would just be scary because what are they gonna do if you do something wrong? Like they could just attack you. And then the other fear of course is being a burden. What if I'm annoying this person? This is the reason I don't approach people. What if I'm annoying them? They probably don't wanna talk to me. They probably are just trying to get away from me. Like why am I doing this? Like just that kind of fear. So because of those two things, that's where the anxiety lies and it's also why I choose not to talk to people. And while I was happy that Marcus was finally leaving me alone after I started being rude to him, I started to not mind the sleep deprivation that much. But when that new roommate came in and he was constantly waking up and she would be so angry and sitting up in her bed so angry but also not confronting him, it just made me really upset because when someone else is upset at something, now it's like I'm upset twice as much. Like I have their upset and my upset. And so while I was fine just coping with not sleeping, knowing that it's affecting somebody else negatively, like it just pushed me over the edge. And so I was just so full of anger every single day. He was also stealing the other person's food because again, he didn't like her and like all this stuff. It was about week three that I came to the realization as I was cutting vegetables in the kitchen that I enter fight or flight mode extremely easily and the reason I was having, you know, sicknesses and vomiting and a lot of other issues I was dealing with was because that chronic stress is coming from the fight or flight sensation. And that's also where a lot of my social anxiety is. And so even though I'm in the kitchen chopping vegetables, I'm really stressed and tense because I know someone could walk in and start talking to me at any minute. 
And I realized in that moment that I just have to learn how to be as comfortable around other people as I am with myself, or at least a level closer to being as comfortable as I am with myself, just to get out of that fight or flight response. And this is something that I was actually able to improve on marginally. I just had to calm myself down, talk to myself rationally, be like, if someone talks to you, you will be able to handle it because you've handled it before and it's fine. Just try to relax. And I would just focus on the physical sensations in my body because like I said, every part of me was tense, you know, heartbeat racing, tightness of breath, all of that kind of thing. But despite the marginal improvements, again, I was just so out of my element and so overwhelmed that I just kept having a lot of physical illness, a lot of intestinal problems, waking up completely drenched in sweat and freaking out, um, being near fainting. I have fainted from anxiety before and things were just not going well, which leads me to the next part, which is it's all my fault. Eventually around the third week, I came to the realization that all of my choices in my life led me to this point. It led me to living this way where I can't sleep, where I'm surrounded by people, where I'm living in a place that's really dirty, where I don't have a dollar to my name. Like this is my choice. Like this is a series of choices I made that led me here. If I was 18 and I went to college for like computer science or something, something practical and chose to have a career, I'd be able to live in an apartment. I'd be able to have stability. All the things that I want now, I would have had. But for some reason, I have never once thought about the future, like the consequences of my actions. Like when I was 18, I was just trying to get away from my parents' house. And then I was in school and I was just trying to get out of school. And then I was living in my van and then I was just trying to figure out what to do with my life. And then I was like, I'll just move to LA and become an actress delusional. Then COVID happened and I got an associate's degree in wine and I started working there and that was great. I had a little bit of a direction, but overall I still just never thought about the long-term consequences of what I was doing and it was really obviously bothering me because I needed to figure out where to go from here. Like this is where my choices led me. How do I actually get out? And so at this point I'd been counting down the days until I got to leave for like a month, over a month, and I was working on the script for the third part in my art series because that one hadn't been pre-recorded. And then I came down with a really bad flu. I was bedridden. I mean, I still had to work obviously. So I'd be bedridden for like a day or two. Then I'd have to work through it for a few days. And then I was bedridden again. I couldn't get out of the hostel. I couldn't get away from Marcus. I was surrounded by people no matter what. I was way more comfortable at that time in public than at home, obviously. In public, I could just be chill. I would just be at the library. It's kind of like being alone. But at home, there's no peace. There's no peace at all. You're just stressed. And at one point during this time, I was like, I'm going to rent a motel room because I'm so full of rage and I am so physically weak that I know that if I don't, I will snap at someone. Like I do get to that point, like I said, with repression, where I start to explode. And usually when that happens, I don't take it out on other people. I abuse substances, I self-harm, I do whatever I can to sort of mitigate the feeling so I'm not attacking others. But being in the environment with all those other people, I figured it would probably be in everyone's best interest if I just removed myself from that situation for a while. Even though the hotel was very expensive, it was the cheapest one I could find and it was still totally out of my budget. Which by the way, I was also feeling exploited at this time. I know I obviously entered the agreement consensually. I agreed to work without pay, but it's like if I had been getting paid, I, had, I would have been making 1500 a month. And if you think about the value of $1,500, it should afford you more than a bunk bed in a room with three people in an apartment that houses 30. So I was also feeling exploited, but I had nowhere to go. And my roommates at this point, other than Marcus, were selling their plasma to try and make enough money to purchase groceries and whatnot. The other issue is that since it is mostly international people who work at hostels and who do these work exchanges, they can't get a visa, so they can't get a job outside of the hostel. And if the hostel isn't paying you, how are you gonna make your money? And at this time too, I had been planning on renting out a room to myself during the winter months because when the hostel shut down for the winter, the boss would rent out rooms. And I was like, well, maybe if I have my own private room, that will be okay and I'll be able to deal with that. But I just wasn't sure. And then I was talking on the phone with one of my friends one day and he told me that if I wanted to fly back to California, he'd let me stay with him until I found somewhere to live. And that's basically what I started to plan on doing. I just had to find my escape route. Because again, I don't have conversations with people because a conversation about feelings and boundaries and standards and what's actually going on is just, I view it as a confrontation because I don't know how they're gonna react. So what I planned on doing and what I ended up doing was faking my grandmother's death so that way I could emergency fly over to California, not burn any bridges. That way, if I do end up wanting to rent a room, I don't have a burnt bridge with the boss, I could still live there, you know, versus if I just told him off or if I just left and blocked him 
or if I just spoke honestly with him about what was going on, who knows, maybe that would have ended really badly. I wanted to keep my options open because I had no idea where I was gonna live. But the day before I was gonna leave, one of my roommates, the newest one, came up to me and was crying, talking about how she couldn't deal with Marcus anymore, selling plasma was making her sick, she couldn't afford groceries, she couldn't get a job here. She was like really freaking out and one of her friends bought her a plane ticket for that day at 5 a.m. Like it was nighttime, the next day at 5 a.m. to fly back to California, sleep on his couch, figure something out. And she was crying and freaking out and I was like, girl, like let me tell you something. I'm about to fake my grandma's death to get out of here. But she was obviously very upset. She didn't know what to do either. She had moved like four times in the last three months. She's very similar to me where our life is just chaos and you just have no stable living environment. We both had our plans to leave. You know, it is what it is. It sucks that other people are gonna have to cover our asses, but we literally couldn't deal with it anymore. I mean, I was vomiting frequently. I had really bad shakes and really bad intestinal problems. She couldn't sleep a single night either. She was like crying every day. It was just a whole ordeal. And so that night I opened up a bottle of wine for us to split. She was packing her bags crying, saying I can't believe this is still my life, which I've never seen a visual representation for how I felt for the past six years than that, of just constant moving and stress and not knowing what you're doing and having no stability and not understanding your actions. Like why, why do we do this? In my brain, rationally, I know I, that I just want stability, but on the emotional level, all I do in my life contributes to chaos. Like, like I'm doing that, but I can't synthesize these parts and just become stable. And so I felt bad for her, but that night she left, didn't say a word, you know, about leaving. I was the only one who knew. Later on that day, I told my manager that my grandma died. And also I went upstairs. I went into the room to grab something. Marcus is there with his headphones on. He turns to me and he says, Claire, do you have an issue with me? And I fucking snapped. Like, I just snapped. I started cursing him out. I was surprising myself because when I get in these fits, it's a surprise to yourself. It's like you're watching yourself do an action, but you're not actually, it's like, you're like, that can't be me. But no, I was cursing him out up and down to high heaven. I was just going off. He was shocked somehow. He's like, he was just extremely inconsiderate and completely not self-aware. That was the problem. And my problem was that I just didn't talk to him about this in an ongoing way like I should have because of my fears of confrontation and my repression and all of these fucking issues. And so I finally snapped, told him off. That was the last time I saw him. He walked out of the dorm. I left in the morning, 5 a.m., never saw him again. But what I feel bad about is that I had to lie to two of my roommates, or at least my roommate and my manager about my grandma dying. And I had to like pretend like I was crying and stuff, you know, the smudged makeup and it just, it felt really wrong. And probably one of you might be watching this video. I apologize, like that's the one thing I feel really bad about but I was afraid that if I told them that I was lying, it might come out to the boss. Like, I don't know. I did what I did. But when I got back to California, I was still really physically ill. I was having severe cramps. I was shaking constantly. I was still, it was like I was locked into a permanent fight or flight mode. Like, I was freaking out. And on top of that, I was back with my same old worries. Just like, where am I gonna live? I'm gonna, am I gonna have to live in my car? Am I gonna be homeless? Where do I go? <laughs> like. Just, this is constant in my life, it's just chaos. What was upsetting about the experience too is that I did it so that way I could focus on YouTube, but it was so difficult too because of my physical illnesses and just because of the distracting environment. And so that just like really depressed me. But it did teach me a lot about how I handle situations and my emotions. Like I said, it taught me what the core of my social anxiety is. The fact that I feel like I have to fulfill everyone's needs around me and that I'm also afraid of being a burden to them and being too bothersome. It also taught me what it feels like to be in fight or flight mode for that long of a time, which helped me really to identify that physical feeling. And I was able to like tone it down at times. And when it came to, you know, anxiety, I wasn't having panic attacks anymore, which is really big for me. I was just vomiting, which is like not as bad, <laughs> apparently, to myself at least. And the experience just taught me what I need to work on, which is, <laughs> again, being assertive, not mean, which is just like talking about your needs with people and trying to not view everything as a confrontation and get into fight or flight mode if someone has an issue with something that you're doing or if you bring up an issue that you have with them because that's really the essence of my problems. It also taught me to never live and work in the same place again. There's no separation there. And a big reason I didn't ever address any complaints about Marcus to my boss is because I was afraid that he would evict me. Like if he says, you're not allowed to criticize this person, they've been here for a year, you've only been here for like a few weeks, like I was afraid that I would get kicked out and then where would I go? Like be on the street? But also just reinforce that I really need to find stability in my life. And now that I recognize that Everything I went through is 
a result of my choices, which it truly is. It's not like I blame myself fully because I was going through a lot of shit back in the day and so that was where all my energy went to, not thinking about the future. But yeah, I hope this video is okay. I guess it's kind of maybe pointless. Maybe it teaches you a little bit about me, some of my flaws, whatever. Maybe it's interesting. I don't know. There is another non-video essay I have in the works that I have been wanting to upload, but I will get back to video essays and my standard content. I guess I just kind of wanted to update people on where I'd been, why it takes me so long to upload videos sometimes because I am always moving and like dealing with things. And if you have issues socializing with people and whatnot, you're obviously not alone. <laughs> it is very much exacerbated within this generation. A lot of people have this issue. And I know some people are like, social anxiety, that's not real. Like that's just, everyone's afraid of socialization. I agree, socializing is probably scary for everybody, but it does become an issue when you completely isolate yourself from everybody like I've done throughout my life many times because you're absolutely terrified of anyone speaking to you ever. <laughs> but leave a comment, a like, I don't know. I'm sorry about this video. It is what it is. Maybe I'll upload it, maybe I won't. Subscribe to my channel if you want to and I will see you in the next one. Bye.